SpaceX raises over 1 billion through two funding rounds. NASA to open International Space Station to tourists. Jeff Bezos shows off cushy tourist space capsule. NASA's space helicopter enters final test phase and Falcon 9 on track for launch on Wednesday. I have to start this episode with another thank you again. I didn't intend for this to be a tradition on every episode, but if you keep subbing so fast, that might well happen. Thank you! <laughs> I hit 100 subscribers in 14 days and I'm already past it. You are the greatest. Last week, my sister from the States visited and I was only able to make one episode, but this is going to change again this week. And from next week on, I'll start to make a fixed schedule. Two episodes per week, one on Monday, one on Friday, with the possibility of another third episode at a random day if time permits. So you will have a more organized schedule that you can count on to get the popcorn ready for the next episode of What About It. So thank you again to all my new subscribers, the family is growing. And to all the new viewers, I'm happy to have you all around. Now let's get back on track and see what news we have here today. SpaceX manages to raise over $1 billion in two funding rounds. SpaceX is building Starship and Super Heavy. SpaceX is shooting the Starlink Mega Constellation into orbit. And SpaceX is certifying Falcon Heavy. And people are wondering, how are they doing all this at the same time? Where's the money coming from? Most skeptics tend to write comments about funding. And it seems valid. How on earth, pun intended, will SpaceX pay for all of this? Especially with Starlink, this argument emerged everywhere in comment sections again. As a loyal SpaceX fan, even I sometimes scratch my head about this question. But fear not, Musk got it covered. There's good news for all of us who want to see these mega projects happen sooner than later. In two recent funding rounds, SpaceX again made the impossible look easy. They raised $1 billion in two funding rounds in this year alone. They raised $486.2 million in one round and $535.7 million in the other. They officially stated this in their filings to the US Security and Exchange Commissions. But what about it? How do they do this and who gives them all the money? The key here, as often, is the stock exchange. They sold all but 18 million worth of available shares. SpaceX is worth a lot of money nowadays. In fact, in a recent estimation, SpaceX broke through another record. It's worth $33.3 billion, making it more valuable than Musk's second famous company. I am of course talking about his electric car company Tesla. Musk recently told reporters that he now has sufficient funds to put Starlink on an operational level. In the end, Starlink is supposed to have 12,000 satellites in orbit around the Earth. This doesn't mean though that it won't be operational before then. Only 1,000 of these small microsats are needed to get it to a level where it's at least operational and competitive in some regions of the world. This indeed is very good news as Starlink is intended to fund the company's Mars endeavors. Starlink makes Starship possible. So let's hope nothing goes wrong and money keeps flowing towards SpaceX in a steady stream. NASA to open International Space Station to tourists. Money makes the world go round. This is not only true for private players. NASA, as we all know from previous episodes of What About It, has some pretty impressive projects going on as well. The moon wants to be conquered and Mars soon after. So it's only logical that the guys from NASA are seeking unconventional ways to raise money themselves. What better to do than to rent out rooms? Rooms with a view you will never forget. In a press conference yesterday, NASA announced that they will open up their crown jewel to the public. That's right, ISS will be open to private research and short-term private astronauts for up to 30 days a mission twice a year. But what about it? What does this change and why is it such a big deal? It may not sound like much. We've had astronauts on the ISS for a long time now. What's different this time though is that they will be from the private sector. NASA's long-term goal here is to kick off a so-called low Earth orbit economy. If there's an option to make money in space, it will be made. Subsequently, if money is made, traffic increases and activity rises. If a market grows, more players will want to enter and find their fortune for themselves. It's a step-by-step -step thing. If humanity wants to enter the space age truly this time, a lot depends on private companies. And let's be honest, there's something fascinating about this. Imagine private stations in deal. 
Imagine them on the moon and then on Mars. If we truly want to have cities on Mars, that's the only way and it's happening right now. So this is what we've been waiting for. I said it before and I'll say it again. It's crazy what's happening in space right now. It's seriously starting to feel more like a gold rush attitude. Jeff Bezos shows off Kashi Space Tourist Capsule. Blue Origin showed their commercial flight capsule at their ReMars convention last week. As you can see in the video, the capsule is pretty fancy looking on the inside. Blue shimmering LED lighting, cushioned walls and cozy seats. All of this will fly on the New Shepard rocket. Passengers will be shot on a ballistic trajectory, briefly going over the common line into space and then landing back at Blue Origin's launch site in Texas. A ticket will come at $200,000 to $300,000, so that will be rather expensive. It should pose quite the view though and there will be more than enough passengers with the right cash to afford the ride. Blue Origin has yet to set a date for the first commercial flights. I'll let you know as soon as there is something new to report on it. NASA's Mars helicopter testing enters final phase. Now here comes one of my favorites, the Martian drone helicopter. Yup, it's gonna happen. If you haven't heard about it yet, let me give you a quick heads up. We've talked about Mars rovers in an earlier episode and as remarkable as they are, they have one serious limitation. The best example definitely is Opportunity. Probably the most famous rover on Mars so far landed on the red planet's surface on January 25th in 2004. Since then it spent 14 years and 212 days exploring our neighbor. It gathered enormous amounts of data, took countless pictures and amazed us so many times some of the team's members responsible at NASA literally cried when the mission came to an end on February 13th this year. Why then did I choose this mission as an example for a limitation? It's because it only covered 49.16 kilometers in those 14 years and 219 days. That's an average of up to 8.5 meters per day. And the pitch! They are rather slow. But what about it? Could this available distance be used more efficiently? Is there a better way to choose targets? Could we scout ahead? If scientists had a faster way of scouting and picking targets for their future rovers on Mars, they could be way more efficient. Opportunity had to literally search every little rock it came across, as there simply wasn't enough range and sight to be picky and go for more interesting targets. If only we could fly. NASA is trying to make exactly that happen. May I introduce you to the Mars helicopter technology demonstration. NASA has been working on this little buzzer for a long time now. Behind closed doors, a team of innovative thinkers started working on a Mars drone already back in 2013. In theory, the drone is supposed to land with the 2020 rover, separate itself from the rover after touchdown and then start scouting for possible research locations. Soon they found out that this is easier said than done. There are three major problems to be solved here. Down on Earth, quadcopters for example can use the thick sea level atmosphere to gain altitude. Also, they can be easily recharged with a cable after flight and communication doesn't pose a problem either. On Mars though, this is a whole different story. Problem number one. The Martian atmosphere only has a pressure of 0.63% of that of Earth atmosphere. Ever tried to fly your quadcopter at a height of 35 kilometers? Up there, you'd have the same atmospheric pressure as on the surface of Mars. Anyone who knows a thing or two about helicopters knows that they have a problem with height. At some point, the atmosphere becomes so thin that a conventional helicopter has trouble holding its altitude. Only greater and greater spin rates of the rotor can counter the lower pressure. Fun fact! On June 21st, 1972, Jean Boulet of France piloted an Aerospatial SA-315B Lama helicopter to an absolute altitude record of 40,814 feet. That's 12,440 meters. At that extreme altitude, the engine flamed out and Boulette had to land the helicopter by breaking another record. The longest successful autorotation in flight history. What a trip. This brings us to problem number two, energy consumption. If the Mars helicopter has to spin its rotor faster, it will consume more energy. Energy which needs to be recharged somehow. 
As reattaching the drone to the rover after every flight would be nearly impossible, it has to be recharged with solar cells, raising its weight even further. To be able to recharge at the rover, it would also have to reattach itself autonomously because of time delay in the communication. Which brings us to problem number three. Mars is far away. Due to this, command signals to any rover or helicopter on Mars take a long time to be sent. On average, a signal sent from Earth to Mars via radio waves has a travel time of 13 minutes and that's only half the way. If you want to establish a two-way communication needed for a direct remote control, add another 13 minutes for the return signal. For a rover, that is fine. The scientists can look at a recent camera image, plan a path, deliver the path command to the rover, which then drives on the surface and reports back its new location and status. This is usually being done in very small steps, centimeters at a time. With a drone though, you want to stay airborne. Once airborne, landing after a few centimeters would defeat the whole purpose of the drone. It's supposed to travel long distances and it has to do it on its own, constantly adjusting to an ever-changing atmosphere literally on the fly. Even though these problems exist, NASA seems to be making good progress. They seem to have solved all of these problems. The chopper did its final flight test in January and has been moved to JPL for final testing and finishing touches on May 11th. So we should be able to get our first aerial drone footage of Martian surface in February 2021. I'll keep you informed. Back to SpaceX. SpaceX Falcon 9 and $1 billion satellite trio set for first California launch in month. SpaceX is on track for its Falcon 9 launch for the Canadian Space Agency and MDA, consisting of three radar Earth observation spacecraft launching on a single rocket. The RadarSat Constellation mission is the next in a series of Canadian RadarSat satellites supporting all-weather maritime surveillance, disaster management, and ecosystem monitoring for the Canadian government and international users. In total, the satellites are worth $1 billion. Fun fact, that's four times the budget of the Canadian Space Agency in one flight. Another record broken for SpaceX, whose previous most expensive payload was the Air Force's GPS-3 SV-01 mission in December of 2018. Handle with care, it's an expensive payload. The mission was delayed numerous times for different reasons. Recently, the launch date was pushed from today to tomorrow. Otherwise, I would have shown you a nice video here, but that will have to wait until the episode on Friday. Let's hope that Falcon 9 launches safely from Slick 4E at Vandenberg Air Force Base. So this wraps up today's episode of What About It? What do you think? Does SpaceX have enough funding for its mega projects now? Will NASA have success with opening the ISS to the public? Will there be enough customers standing in line for Bezos ride to space and will the chopper fly on Mars? Let me know in the comments. I want to hear your opinion. Thank you for watching this episode of What About It? If you liked what you saw, don't forget to subscribe and like because this helps me the most. Feel free to hit me up on my Patreon page so I can get additional help in making more and better content. This gives me more time to focus on what I love doing the most, to give you the latest and greatest about space and science. I hope to see you on the next episode. Until then, have a great time. End the pitch! <laughs>